Everybody deals with disappointments, and uh, they always catch us <coughs> blindsided. It, it seems like we're always surprised when we face a disappointment in our life. Um, <laughs> but, and then we kind of deal with it, and then we face another disappointment, and we're like, man, surprise. So, uh, so everybody goes through this, and that's what we're looking at. Last week we started talking about sickness. Uh, we just have a few more things to talk about with sickness, and then we're going to go uh, on to uh, death and betrayal. Um, so, okay. I don't know how far we're going to make it, but we will stop either at or before 8. Um, so, in, uh, we were looking in John. Let's go ahead and turn to John 9. And we'll be looking a lot in John and uh, John 9 and 11 and uh, Matthew. John 9, verse 1, and we'll pop down to chapter 11 a little oh, later. Okay. Um, okay, so as he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, or a man blind from birth. He didn't see him from birth. <laughs> it's important where you put words in a sentence. <laughs> and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, and he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. He must work the works of him who sent me. I'm sorry, we must work the works of him who sent me as on your this day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. And all the men who were here last, last week, you know, laughed a little bit at spittle, didn't you? Don't, don't, don't hide it. <laughs> and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went away and washed and came back seen. So there's, there's just a few things happening here. Um, but when we looked at this last week, and, and just a point I kind of want to make here, God acts how he decides and not, not the way we want. Sometimes when we pray for things, especially healing, we kind of come to our own conclusions about what we want to see happen. And... Um, Sometimes God has his own plan. <laughs> you know, and so like, for instance, Jesus could have just touched him, and he would have seen, right? But instead, you know, Jesus goes through this process of spitting, and then rubbing the dirt nastiness on his eyes, and then having him go and wash it off. And it's like this, you know, why so many steps, God? And, you know, sometimes God does things in, in a way that might not make sense to us. But at the end of the day, it is his way, and not ours. Why I say this is because a lot of times, especially with sickness, but also with other things, we kind of do an inventory of the situation, you know, and we weigh in our heads the pros and cons of what could happen and what could happen and all that kind of different things. And then we kind of register in our minds the most efficient way that God would work. And then we, pr we expect him to do that because we've done a very thorough analysis. So you should at least look at our analysis and conclude with our obvious <laughs> idea that we are right. <laughs> and then instead, God does this whole thing. You know, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to kind of get around. Um, but that especially applies to, to, to sickness. Um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So that brings it to a very interesting point. You know, my great-grandpa um, had various things going on with him. Um, he had a uh, brain tumor, he had uh, cancer throughout his body, and God healed him of the cancer in his body, but then he still died from the tumor in his brain. And that obviously leaves the question of why? Why do you put all the bother of healing if you're just going to let them die from the other part of the camp? It just doesn't really maybe seem to make sense. I think, personally, why God sometimes does look like that is to remind us that even if he did let my great-grandpa die from the brain tumor, he can.
on him. To just kind of give his idea that I wanted him to pass at this time. And I, I don't lose faith in me to, to heal. I wanted him to die at this time. You know, and there's something in that where we just have to acknowledge that, you know, God is the one who's in control of life, <laughs> not us. Uh, so with that being said, um, believe that God can heal you even to death. And if God decides not to heal you, still believe that he can and in other times will. Just because God chooses not to heal you doesn't mean that God doesn't heal us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like for instance, Grace just shared her story about leukemia and how 18 years ago they said, hey, you're going to have to come back in a few days for more blood, and she hasn't come back in 18 years. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, other people I know have, have died of cancer within the last 18 years. People that went here, you know. And uh, so obviously there's that belief even if you don't see it. And what I mean by that is, is I'm not talking about just, just blind belief where you're saying, okay, God will heal me, God will heal me, and then you die and God didn't heal you. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I, I, I'm saying, like, God can. It's just up to God whether he does. And we have to be okay with that. Somewhere along the way, I think we just kind of get this demanding attitude that God has to. I asked, so you have to answer. And God doesn't really work on our time frame about stuff. You know, and uh, as, as troubling as that is, um, I think we'll find in the end that it'll, it's, it's better that way. That's the hard part is we, we have to be okay with it. Right. right. And, you know, and, and the other thing is, you know, when, when you ask for healing, but if not, right. you know, your will. Yeah. If you're healed in heaven. Right. Right. Yeah, and actually that's on here later. <laughs> so. Okay, sorry. She's a mind reader now. She is a mind reader. She knew. She looked at my notes. <laughs> I'm telling Jesus. I'm just kidding. Okay, so Matthew 28, uh, 5 through 7. Why I want to spend so much time looking over Jesus um, as we're talking about these different things with disappointments is, you know, from a human perspective, Jesus faced a lot of disappointments in his life. But Jesus just has this. I mean, I know he's God. I know that. But Jesus just has this way of, of processing stuff that just breaks us. You know, Jesus is one of those, he's that person, not one of those people. He's that person that you can always look at, always analyze, and always be amazed at. Just, I mean, the, just, he's just an amazing person. Matthew 28, verse 5 says this. The angel said, uh, said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples excuse me, that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So, that brings us to the point that Renee <laughs> just said. Healing will come. Maybe in next life, but it will come. Sometimes we get overly focused on this life. And that's just not, not good. You know, God has eternal purposes in what he does. And we like to revolve around everything we do as though we're going to be here for forever. But, I mean, just look, look at our bodies. We're falling, we're falling <coughs> apart as, we, as we're here. I mean, goodness sakes. I wake up with new pains and stuff. And I'm like, why? I'm only in my 20s. You know, and then I hear a 50 year old saying, ah, so I get it. I, I'm starting to get it. I'm not going to be a kid forever. Uh, you know, and, and so there's that, there's that part of us that just wants to hold on to um, living here forever in this like perfect little bubble where nothing bad happens. And uh, it's just not, it's not going to work like that. Um, so healing does come, but maybe in the next life. We don't know that. And we have to be, once again, going back to that idea that we have to be okay with that. And we have to just kind of follow God's lead on stuff. Pray knowing that God heals. But if he chooses not to, he's got other plans. And that brings me to this very last point that I want to make about sickness. See your sickness as an appointment from God for a specific purpose. That's very difficult because what we like to do is we like to see our sickness as a barrier or a problem. <coughs> see what I mean? God, you cannot use me while I'm sick. Therefore, you have to heal me so that you can use me. Meanwhile, it's God saying, or I could do this. <laughs> In other words, what I'm saying here is your pain is a bridge to someone else. 
not a barrier between you and someone else. Does that kind of make sense? Having, for instance, cancer might give you the opportunity to talk to somebody that you never would have been able to talk to before. You know what I mean? Uh, having, you know, little little things, little nagging things that aren't really that big of a deal, like arthritis and stuff. It's, it's annoying, it's painful, but I mean, you'll live. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, it, it might be annoying, but then at the same time, you know, it can really minister to other people. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I have arthritis in my hand. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, see your pain as a bridge to other people's hurt, as a bridge to other people's heart. And uh, see your sickness as an appointment from God. Now, keep in mind that a lot of times with sickness, you're going to be off your feet. You're going to be laying down on your couch. It's not going to be fine. Especially if you're people, well, like us, who are very ants in our pants. You know, we want to we get going. And uh, sometimes when you're sick, you really can't just get going. And that's hard. But once again, um, don't refuse to see your sickness as a, as a wall. Start seeing it as an appointment from God. And think your, your outlook starts changing, too. Okay, uh, so we're going to go on to death now. <coughs> yes! We didn't get the ultimate overtime. Yes! <laughs> well, it was actually funny. Um, I forgot how, but Chuck was talking to Mary, his grandma. Um, and somehow it came up about, you know, how we're all working our way to death. This is how she, she said, we're, we're all slowly dying or something like that. And so, so Chuck's all sitting, I mean, that's a dark way of looking at it, but... <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so Chick's all sitting in his wheelchair once, and somebody all walks up and he says, oh, Hey, how are you doing? He's, and he looks up and he says, I'm dying. <laughs> he doesn't know he's a kid, but I mean, that's just funny. Hold on. Anyway, so Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. <coughs> Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So the first point I want to make about death is that life continues after death. I know we get wrapped up in our death when we start worrying about it and we lose sleep thinking about our, the time of our death. Or, you know, when we get sick, that's like the first thing on our heads. I'm dying, you know, especially if you're a guy and you have a cold. It's like, oh, no, I'm dying. I need soup. Uh, uh, stat. You know, and then, uh, but there's a, this, there's a very simple point here, and that's after your death on this planet, life goes on. And then even for you, life goes on because you don't cease to exist. You, you know, you're not like reborn into something else. You go, you go to heaven. So life continues on. Um, sometimes we see death kind of out of, um, out of, uh, <coughs> Yes, out of proportion. In fact, another point I kind of want to make here is it's the death of a seed that leads to that seed being planted and bringing you a new life. Even in a forest, the forest dies, it's burned like a fire or something like that, and from those ashes, it actually cultivates, or not cultivates, um, fertilizes the soil again to cause new growth to come up. So even in the death of the planet, there's life in the planet. How much more can God work life from death in us and in our lives. See, we look at things, at things as final. You know, like, I have until I die to see this miracle come through. Well, so the world just ceases to exist because you're not living on it? <laughs> like, we, it's, death has, it doesn't have quite such a strong hold as we kind of make it out to be. Um, and God will keep working. So now back to John uh, 11. See, I told you we were going to be in John 11. I hope you guys had your fingers on them. John 11, starting in, uh, well, we'll start probably in verse 1. <coughs> now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified by it. And that brings us to a very important point that kind of builds up what I just said about the death of the seed and all that stuff. 
God can make even death have purpose. God has a way of working things that seem tragic into things that are really are beautiful. And death is no exception. You know, um, like for instance, it says, death, where now is your sting? Because, you know, what was, what was such a terrible, terrifying thing, God worked to a better purpose. And uh, so it's through our death, for instance, that we'll taste of the resurrection. Well, in the resurrection, things will be infinitely better than they are now. In fact, Paul spoke of it like this. He said, I'm convinced that the things that we're going through, they're not even worth mentioning at the same time as the things that we're going to be experiencing there. It's just, it's not in the same league. Um, so then uh, we go through the story, and Jesus delays <coughs> as though he's not worried about it. Imagine that. And uh, then, then he says, okay, yeah, I guess we can go ahead and go on there now. And the disciples say, whoa, hold on. Don't you remember how people don't like you there? And he's like, well, I just kind of got my own thing. Uh, you know, Lazarus is sleeping. I have to go wake him up. And they say, hey, well, this sounds like a win situation. If he's asleep, that means he's recovering. He'll be fine. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. He, he's dead. Just let me clarify that he is dead. You, you didn't get what I was saying. And so then they, they go, and uh, Martha comes up, and she's like, if you would have been here, if you just would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Why did you let us down, Jesus? I know you were, you were able to have done this thing. Why? Because now that we've reached death, now there's not a single thing you can do about it. Right? Because Jesus is the only Lord of life and not of death. So, so you, you see her misunderstanding there. So we get to 21. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now this is a very common process that everyone goes through. And we're not just talking about death here. This can be applied really to anything. Something happens, a disappointment in life. Fill in the blank. It can be whatever. This, and then that, this leaves you with unresolved grief because maybe it's painful, maybe it just really took a chunk out of you, whatever. This leads to you feeling kind of powerless. There's nothing I can do to fix this. Um, you see this happen in kids when their parents get divorced, for instance. There, there's nothing that I can do. It was because of me. It was my fault that my dad left or that my mom left or whatever. Um, so there's this unresolved grief, which leads to these feelings of powerlessness, which then leads to anger. In fact, I will say this, 9 out of 10 times, people who have anger problems actually just have a really, really damaged heart. Something, some, some devastation was done to their heart, usually in their childhood, usually not always. And then they mature into adulthood, and they still have that wound, but because it's just this open, festering wound, it turns into anger. Because they feel powerless. That's human nature. It's, a, it, it's something that you can predict happening. Another, another example if, is if you see someone who's overly controlling or a perfectionist, oftentimes this is because of a situation that they couldn't fix. And so they try to compensate by being perfect, by fixing everything, by making sure everyone around them is perfect, by just make, you know, by trying to, trying to fix it. I can, I can fix this. When all it is is it comes down to that feeling of unresolved grief. So you have here Martha who's going up to Jesus you can see her in the grieving process. She's, she's clearly past denial. And that takes us to five stages of grief. She's clearly past denial. She seems to be in anger. <laughs> I could be wrong, but it seems like she's in anger. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of almost, almost she's at the bartering stage, you know, where she's like, oh, it, oh, if only you, oh, it, oh. you know, and uh, this is a healthy process. This is the way that you're actually going to come to a place of accepting the loss, is by working through it. Sometimes we start having these emotions that we feel aren't godly, which they aren't, probably, if you let them kind of get a hold of you. Do you understand what I'm saying? For instance, um, being angry at a situation versus gossiping about everybody and backbiting everybody and snapping everybody's head off. You know, see what I mean? Where, where you're going through the grieving process and you let it get the better of you, which it once again happens all the time. Um, but the way to work through it is to be aware of this. When, whenever you go through a disappointment in life, and death is, I think, one of the biggest disappointments we can go through, we have this idea that you know our parents are always going to be there. Then they die, and we're like, ah, oh, that was unexpected. We have we have this idea that our kids won't ever die before we die, and then they do, and we're like, oh, well, that was disappointing. You know, we have all these things that just catches by 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 surprise. And uh, so that takes us to the stages of grief. Be aware of this because you will be working through this sometime in your life. Or maybe you already have. You will again. <clears throat> uh, in fact, some people just kind of uh, get caught in a spiral on the stages of grief and they just keep repeating. 
they go like, for instance, they'll go denial to depression to bartering back to denial, and they just get stuck in this in this rut over and over again. Um, but if it, if it's a very natural and healthy process that you really do have to work out. Um, I would highly recommend prayer and a lot, a lot of the Bible. If, for instance, if you pray normally one hour a day, I would up it to about three if you're going through a severe depression, a severe disappointment in life. Uh, if you were reading two chapters of the Bible, I would up that to about twelve. Mm -hmm. I mean. It's it's not where you disappointment really can blindset us and catches off of our game in a big way. So, anyways, uh, so just be aware of this the, the natural process. The first is denial that you know this isn't really happening. I uh, the, I can still fix this. The, you know, this this isn't really happening. Then the next is anger. I can't believe that this happened. God, how could you let this happen? I trusted you. You you weren't supposed to have done this. You know, and then the third one, bartering. Look, okay, if there's just something I can do, if there's just something I can do, we can just fix it. Then the, then the fourth one, depression, <laughs> nothing I do matters. Why even try? Then you get to the fifth one, which if you get here, guys, sometimes it's a fight to stay here. But you can. You can stay here, acceptance. It's not that you're any more okay with the event happening. It's more of you accept it as an event that happened in your life. Not that it doesn't hurt, but it's an event that happened in your life. Does that kind of make sense? For those of you who have lost parents or a loved one, you kind of get what I'm talking about. Well, hopefully you do. If you haven't, then you know, start working on this. Um, you can't live your life wounded. It's, it's really not the best. Anyways, um, so in Luke chapter 23, the only verse I believe that we're going to be looking at in Luke Chapter 23, starting in verse 46, uh, and then I'm going to look at 2 Samuel. Don't worry about that one. Uh, you don't have to turn there. It's just a, I'm just going to read a real quick thing. I'll be done with it. In verse 46, it says this. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, this is obviously talking about when Jesus is dying on the cross. Um, but there's just this, this bit that I really, really, really want you to, you to grasp onto. When faced with the death of a loved one, you have to let go your hold. You have to let them go. They're gone. Sometimes we try and hold on for all it's worth. It's not going to do you any good. You, you, you got to let it go. Then you wind up a year later with a heart attack. Right. It does cause unnecessary stress. Yes, absolutely. Um, one, no, one, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Like, this isn't just with death. This is like... With a lot of things in life. Yeah, like disappointment. We're exactly why I called this dealing with disappointments. We can we're looking at three specific things, but really, guys, he's right on. All these things apply to bigger things than just sickness, death, and betrayal. Really, they do. So, uh, did I cut you off? Well, no. I mean, did you, know, you guys something else to say? You're teaching, so I'm kind of. I feel like I'm kind of cut from the. If you have something to say, go for it. Uh, and the last part, the stages of grief, you know, when you're, when you're going through any one of those things, it, and, and I think, I think that, and I, you know, if you take any counseling at all there, that's all over the place. Right. And, and um, when you're younger, sometimes, it, you know, you haven't lost loved ones. I, I don't mean you can't, I wish you could that part. <coughs> but sometimes... <laughs> We, we, we struggle with one of those areas a little bit more than other yeah, of those areas. Very common. Some people uh, live in denial. They'll talk to a dead loved one for 40 for years. years. Yeah. Yes. And, and some people get angry and they never get over anger. Yeah. Um, the bartering, you know, uh, different things. But one thing I noticed, and once you start getting a taste of acceptance, it tastes good. Yeah. Now, you may not live there. At first, you may just get a little taste, and, and then it has a day or two, but it's like, wow, I really need to let that go because yeah. that really tastes good. Yeah. It, it, that, that's where I want to be, and I yeah. want to be at a place where, you know, I'm really accepting. And, and, you know, it seems like the last few months, and I've, I've always known this in my head, is that <laughs> God doesn't answer. We pray for something, and we're looking for the result, but we really are wanting God to do it a certain way. Right. And he's... Like micromanaging. <laughs> yeah, or... 
you think if God's going to do this, this is the way he's going right. to do it, which is not the case at all. Yeah. And then there's some situations that may not resolve at all. Right. You just have to accept them. But regardless of whether, of whatever the situation is, he's not working like we think we should or, or he thinks we, mm. like we think we should or whatever, there has to be an acceptance right. of God. You know, yeah. if you never, if you never ever resolve this, yeah. I'm serving you. Right. You know, and, and you, you really see it all in the scripture. Yeah. David, when the baby dies, it's like, hey. That's, on the very next I'm slide. Sorry, no, 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 yeah, you're, you're, you're right on. You're following my my my, my process. And yes, absolutely. Like <laughs> follow I gave him the note. You know how sometimes in political things they'll kind of put certain people there to speak into the mic to ask a certain question a certain way. I planted him. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, but yes, absolutely, that, that whole idea of acceptance. You need that up there for just a second. Uh, the last one? This one that you, you're on right now. Leave it alone? Okay, give, me, give me 30 seconds. Okay, all right. Okay, so we were looking at... Um, man, there was something that you said that I was going to build off of, and I completely forgot what it is bothering me now. Because I am <coughs> back there, it's... <coughs> uh, the what? The no, I have that on the slide. No. Oh, it was before that. It was probably somewhere in the middle. See your moments. You were talking about. Oh, I think it was when you brought up the stages of grief again. And there was something in there that I wanted to mention. Some people deal with certain areas more than other areas. Or when you start tasting acceptance. I'm gonna eat up too much time if I if I try and remember this. I better just plow ahead. Um, so okay, when when oh I remember what it was. Um, it, it it wasn't it wasn't because I, I was gonna say something real similar anyway. So I'll just go ahead and say what I was originally planning to say. Um, I think that this is one of the reasons why. Now obviously we we looked at the whole contacting the dead a couple a couple months ago or whatever. Um, so you know I already we already talked about that back then. But I think one of the reasons why God mourns about not contacting the dead is because of this. You really just have to let go of, of the people when they die. You know, we, we, we like the idea of we're still in control. So some people conjure up ideas of, of you know feeding their dead ancestors through different rituals. Some people try and conjure up the spirits to talk to them in seances. Uh, some people, um, what's another one that they do? Some people think that their that their dead ancestors are reborn as pick something, um, coyote or something. You see, what I mean, it's anything that we can do to really. Uh, Hold on. I know some people who say my dead one contacts me by leaving pennies around, which actually is fairly common. When I first heard somebody say, I was like, "You're crazy!" But then I started hearing people say it like all over the place. I was like, "Oh, this is a thing. People actually believe that." Okay. Whoops. Wouldn't have made fun of you so heartily if I would have known that this. You know. <laughs> but anyway, um, one exercise that I actually literally had to do is I had to go like this with my hands and pretend like I was holding this person. And then just go like this. I had to physically do that to just, God, I'm letting it go. I'm letting it go. And I know it sounds silly, I know it sounds stupid, but that's what you really have to do is you just have to say, God, I'm hands off. I'm done. It's yours. And uh, you know, that's the way God intended it to be. <laughs> he is the master of death. When he takes a soul to heaven, he takes her soul. It's his now. And uh, that's not yours to hold on to. And so, okay, St. Samuel uh, 12, 14. Once again, you don't have to turn here if you don't want to. This is the story of the baby that, um, uh, spoiler alert over there, was talking about. <laughs> so St. Samuel uh, uh, 12, 14 through 23, it says, However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went and lay, on the, um, lay all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died, and the servant of David, servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. 
how then can we tell him that the child is dead since he might do, do himself harm? But when David saw that his servants were sleep, whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he came to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. Boy, that's hard to do when you lose, guys. Ooh, that's hard to do. Then he came to his own house, and, went, and when he uh, requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. When the child died, you rose and ate food? There was, you have to understand, back then, not, I mean, people still do it today, but it's, it was more of a public thing back then. They had days of, of, of mourning. So people would actually dress themselves in certain clothes and go out together as like a group to mourn. Um, people don't do that so much anymore, but they still obviously mourn. So I don't know, whatever. Um, he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And that's kind of the thing I wanted to emphasize here. You really do have to let it go. John chapter 11, back again. In verse 24, we read 21 uh, on the last slide where Martha says, Lord, have you just been here? So here in verse 24, uh, Martha's talking again, and she says, Martha said to him, I know that he, that, um, that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus is telling him, you know, your, your brother will rise again. And Martha completely misses what he's saying. I, I know, you know, you, you in the resurrection, he'll rise again. I, I but something that, that's important to remember is that death really does come to all eventually. Sometimes we think, oh God, why didn't you save my child or save my, save my parent or save the, whatever? Everybody dies eventually. Now, it might be hard for us to let them go at that time because we weren't ready to let them go at that time. But everybody dies eventually. See what I mean? Sometimes we get so bitter towards God because he didn't heal, heal that person at that time. It's like, well, if it was their time to go, it's, it's their time to go. It, it, let's say, for instance, okay, let's say you have a spouse who's got cancer. And you pray and pray for God to heal them. God does not heal them, and they die. Okay? Now let's have another hypothetical situation. That same person, God does heal them. And they walk out of the hospital. God's healed me. They get in their car, they start heading home, and they're T-boned by a truck and they die. You see what I mean? Like, everybody's going to die eventually. It's not something that we have to look at death and fear. And it's not something that we have to look at death and say, death has won. We don't have to do that. You know, it, it's our human nature to do that, but we really don't have to do that. We can face it and accept it. Always hard to do, but it is always worth doing. Verse 21 says, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Don't blame others or attack others while you are disappointed. Whenever you're in a disappoint, disappointing situation, your, your, your natural tendency is going to be to attack somebody. In this case, Jesus. Did Jesus cause him to die? Did Jesus go and poison him? No, he was over there doing ministry. It wasn't Jesus' fault that he died. He just died. See what I mean? But yet, here she is. If you had done this, you don't know how many times I've heard people do this. Um, especially, this, this is a real big danger too. A husband and wife who something happens to their child. The natural tendency, I don't know why, but the natural tendency is for the husband and wife to start biting at each other. And in all likelihood, it's probably not your spouse's fault. I mean, unless it was like some drug incident tonight. Well, that's something else. But in a, in a, in a healthy... In a healthy family, it probably wasn't your spouse's fault. <clears throat> so anyways, um, don't blame others and start attacking people because you're disappointed with the way things went. Um, and then, this is the last point I want to make for death. <coughs> Thank God for the time you did have. It changes your perspective. Instead of <clears throat> focusing so much on, but they died, but look at the time that you had with them. But their death brought me such sorrow. Their death was a moment. Their life was much more. Right? Let's say, for instance, your, your child dies at birth. Great example. Perfect example. Your child dies at birth. The excitement that that child gave you while you found out that you were, you were pregnant, while you went through the... Yes, it is difficult to see the room that they'll never live in. I, I get that. 
But instead of focusing on the moment of their death, focus on the nine months of their life that brought you such joy. See what I mean? And that's hard to do. I'm not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Death is never easy. Death is, it is always hard. But when you come to a place of accepting it and looking at the positive side, if you can look at the deaths around you and see the positive in it, Everything else kind of seems like small price. <laughs> Sometimes you got to take a deep breath. Right. You know, during all of that, and you got to look around you and see what kind of effect that person's death has had on others. We've seen it multiple yeah. times in family. And, you know, drawing people <coughs> in. Um, God, God has his work and he has his timing and his purpose. Um, you know, now that you brought that up, one thing that I kind of wanted to mention that's not on here is Sometimes, especially in like a married, married situation, when you face a really devastating loss, it's very common for both spouses to kind of withdraw in different ways. Um, typically, the man, for instance, will be so overwhelmed with his grief and like he'll just do, go off and do his own thing. Kind of like a dog that gets sick and knows it's about to die. You know, they go out by themselves. It's kind of like what men do a lot of times. Um, unfortunately, women don't really work like that. <laughs> so oftentimes, you know, that can cause some problems there. Obviously, because she's wanting to talk about it, and all the guy wants to do is just move on. Very difficult for those kind of situations. Um, but anyways, um, where you kind of, yeah, have, you have to stop and say, yeah, I'm hurt, but what's going on with other people, too? Um, so. um, and I, I, I have a little note written here that I for, totally forgot to mention. Success in life is if you love well and obey God well. You might say, oh, I didn't get to do everything that I wanted to do. They didn't get to live their life as long or as healthy as, or as happy as I wanted them to. But ultimately, it just comes down to the success in life is if you loved well and obeyed God well. See, if you focus so much on the hurt that has been caused there, you're not going to be able to yourself love people because you're too bad focusing on your hurt. See what I mean? And you're not going to be able to obey God because he's going to say, hey, move. And you're going to say, I'm still, I'm still grieving. See what I mean? And it's not healthy to wrap your whole life around somebody's death. That's not healthy. You know, I mean, think of, I, I think of my, my son Micah. He would not want me to sit around grieving his loss for the rest of my life. I mean, he wouldn't want that. See what I mean? There, I know he's four, but he still has the idea of, you know, this, let's get up and play, you know? It, and it's kind of a little bit, maybe more naive, but I think that naivete really has something to teach us in all our complexity. Um, anyways, so we'll go on ahead and go on to Betrayal, the last one. We're not really going to look at this too much tonight, because we're going to have to finish it next week. Um, once again, it's getting close to the 8 o'clock mark. Um, so if you have been alive, you have been betrayed. <laughs> And uh, a lot of the things that we're going to be looking at with betrayal, you'll find, really does apply um, to, to, once again, like we were talking about, to other areas of disappointment. Don't ever make the mistake of believing that you are the only person who's ever been hurt. Don't ever make that mistake. You'll get wrapped up in your own hurt, and you'll forget people around you. you know, everybody's facing disappointments of their own. <coughs> you can either, once again, use that as a bridge to somebody else, or you can use it as an excuse for only caring about yourself. Because let's be honest, when you refuse to, to, to grow and learn from disappointment, that's being selfish. Because life isn't about you. It really isn't. I know that, that that's hard to hear, but as somebody who's dealt with a lot of betrayal, a lot, a lot of hurt, a lot of disappointment, a lot of sickness, a lot of death, I, I say this as, as a witness to it. <laughs> I really do. Um, you can't let your whole life be ruined by negative things that have happened. God left you on this earth for I don't know how long. Make a count. Okay, so we'll look first at 2 Samuel 16. Now, this is an amazing thing. If you know, I'll set up the story. You guys don't have to turn it if you don't want to. Um, we're going to be rapidly going through some points here. But um, to just kind of set up the story. Um, so, okay, David has sex with this guy's wife. His, her name's Bathsheba. She, she bore the child that died that we looked at in chapter 12. So, basically, David had killed the husband, and, you know, this is this whole long thing. That's a whole other conversation. And for <coughs> this, God told him, the sword is never going to depart from your house. You're just, you're just going to have all kinds of family problems, and it's going to stem from this. Um, so then, 
Long story short, some things happened with somebody getting raped and another brother, you know, goes off on the lamb and stuff. One of David's sons, his name is Absalom, he comes and basically seizes the control from his father. Um, that's, the, that's the short version. If you really want the longer version, start in 2 Samuel 12 and just go forward from there. I mean, really, there's like 17 chapters or something like that. It's just, it's, we're not going to be able to cover all that. But so, okay, so in 15, Absalom gets ready to, to, to take over, and he starts heading towards Jerusalem to take it over. And in verse 13, uh, uh, David finds out about this. He decides to run. And as he's going, like, all these things are happening. This person comes up and says something, and this person comes up and says something. It's like this thing after thing going on here, which I don't know about you, but when I'm in an irritating situation like this, um, an unexpected betrayal, for instance, uh, <laughs> you, you don't really want to deal with other people's nonsense. I got other things to do. So people are literally coming to David person after person. It's like, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> That's fine. You can come with me. Do whatever you want. I'm just going now. Uh, so in 16, uh, 5, through 13, 5 through 13, it says this. When King David came to Behurim, he's, he's walking away from Jerusalem, and he gets to a place called Behurim. Behold, there came out from there a man of the a family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came out cursing continually as he came. He threw stones at David and, all, at, um, at, all, <laughs> and at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. Thus Shimei said when he cursed, Get out, get out, young, uh, you man of blood and worthless fellow. The Lord has returned upon you <coughs> all the bloodshed of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord um, has given the kingdom uh, into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken uh, in your own people, <coughs> for you are a man of bloodshed. Then Abishai the son of Zariah said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. Then the king said, What have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah? If he curses, and if he, uh, um, and if the Lord has told him, curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came out from, my, from, uh, came out from me seeks my life. How much more now the Benjaminite, or this Benjaminite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Perhaps the Lord will look on, me, on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. So David and his men went on, uh, on the way, and Shimei and I went along the, on the hillside parallel with him, and as he went, he cursed and cast stones and threw dust at him. So, let's just deal with how irritating the situation is. He's already disappointed, and you got this guy, like, literally, have you ever, um, you remember high school, does anybody here remember going to high school? <laughs> and you know, there's people, there's those people who follow you around, and they keep poking at you, and keep bugging you, it's like, just leave me alone, or if you've ever had older siblings. <laughs> okay, maybe we can work with this. You know, they, they, keep, they keep going and they keep going. So you turn them off race that they follow you and they just keep going. And they, that's exactly what's going with this guy. And he's not just saying mean, hurtful, irritating things. He's also throwing dirt, dirt at him and, and rocks and stuff. Do so you know how, how annoying that is to get dust on you? And you're like, I can't see. Just stop. Just literally, I, I get your point. You hate me. Now move on. But David's just like, okay, let's just let this happen. And there's a few things that he says that are really just very, um, I want to say, enlightened the first thing he says in, in verse 11 that is really unique is he says that if my son is seeking my life, how much more this man, this man who doesn't know me intimate, as intimately as my son. So he gives him more grace rather than giving him less grace. That blows my mind first off. <laughs> if it was me, I would have said, okay, I'll, I'll deal with Absalom because he's my son. But you need to get up on out of here. See what I mean? That's how we think. That's the exact opposite of what David did. That blows my mind. And then the next one, um, down in verse 12, perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction. Perhaps by letting myself be persecuted in this way, God will work it out into a blessing instead. Ah, this sounds like a good idea, David. And uh, Jesus kind of talks on this when he talks about, you know, um, uh, blessed are you when people persecute you because, you know, all this stuff. Uh, Matthew 5, um, 3 to like 12 or something like that. Um, okay, uh, so then that brings us to a very in interesting point. Do you know how a husband can tell, the easiest way that a husband can tell how he is doing as a man, as a Christian, and how, he, how much he is resembling Christ? By looking at his attitudes and his wife's attitude. That is one of the quickest ways that a man 
can tell how much like Christ he is acting. One of the quickest ways. You know, God specifically told a man to treat his wife like Christ treated the church. He never once told the wife to treat the husband like Christ treated the church. See what I'm getting at? That means that the man has a higher responsibility in the, in the marriage. It's more his fault when there's a problem than it is her fault. Ooh, I don't like that. No wonder. Ooh, I don't like that at all. <laughs> Whoa, pause there, Jesus. <laughs> you need to calm down with that. Have you met my wife? <laughs> so then, after we say something like that, a very interesting <laughs> point comes up. <laughs> so then, after we come to this idea of, God, you just haven't met my wife, God. She's the real problem. Then we come to a really important idea. If Jesus was married to the most difficult woman in the world, how would he have treated her? Ah, and that really shows the motivation of our heart right there. See, the problem is, is that we as men, and I can't speak for you women because I've never been a woman, <laughs> but uh, we as men, we, we don't really like to take criticism very, very well. And uh, so when it comes down to it and our wife says something, we just kind of see it as an annoyance. You know, we kind of just want her to shut up, you're wrong. But you'd be surprised how much you'd be surprised how much wisdom and insight your wife can offer you if you're willing to listen. You'd be very surprised. You know, when you run when you run a company, you read books about how to better run a company, right? When you lead, you read books about how to better lead. I'm amazed that we as men don't take the same steps towards treating our wives better. Doesn't that kind of make sense? I mean, if I read books to help me be a better businessman, shouldn't I read a book to make me be a better husband? Doesn't that make sense? That, that, just, that just sounds good, right? So, I mean, then you get to parts like Genesis where it talks about the man and the woman being one, and you realize, as a man, I, I might not be doing the best that I could be doing. I might not be showing Christ to my wife like I, like I thought I was. Here's a good example. When you get home from work, you're tired, and you just want to sit on the couch and watch TV, right? I mean, you just want to kind of zone out. Meanwhile, your wife has been home with the kids all day, and been cleaning all day, been cooking all day. And the house may look like a pigsty, but you put a lot of time and effort into that pigsty. <coughs> and so rather than being understanding and helping her, we as men kind of act like an overlord. And what I'm getting at is this. Jesus would not do that. Jesus would not. Jesus had a very other-centered attitude, and, I, and when I hear Jesus, to, or Paul, actually, tell us to be like Christ to our wives, I see in me things that I don't like. I see in me impatience towards my wife, or Jesus would show patience. I see in me an irritation at my wife's emotions when Jesus didn't have that. And I, I think that a lot of times we like to just shift the blame, especially as men, it's somebody else's fault. Whatever we're talking about. We're not just talking about marriage anymore. We're talking about life. It's somebody else's fault. I don't know whose fault it is, but it's not my fault. And, uh, but what we have here with David is something entirely different. Accept the betrayal because you can learn from it. When somebody betrays you and they're saying mean, hurtful things, take a second and see if you can learn something from it. And if you can't learn anything from it, then at least you can endure with dignity and God will bless you for it. Well, that sounds like a win-win. Worst case scenario, you find something in your character that is wrong. Even if they said it in the wrong way, you find something that's wrong and you get to grow from it. And women, this, this is something you can do too. Find something that, okay, yeah, I can grow here. And then best case scenario, you are perfect and sinless, and God will bless you all the more for the unfair treatment that you've gone through. I mean, that sounds like a good thing, right? But the problem is we have this thing called pride. <laughs> and we don't want to hear people's idea of what's wrong with us. We want to hear them tell us what's right with us. Come on! <laughs> uh, anyways, um, so here's the thing. In all this, remember that God is in control. And he's working through your betrayals. That's hard, but that's the way it is. I mean, a perfect example of this would be Joseph, whose own brothers betray him, sell him into slavery. This seems like a bad situation. He ends up as a slave. You know, he, he ends up in prison. You know, so we've got an ex, and we've got an ex-con here. You know, he's, a, he's one of the rough crowd. You know, and he ends up being Pharaoh's second-hand man. 
And then at the end of the book, he says, you, you guys mean these things for evil, but God just, he's working all, good, all kinds of good out of this. See, because it wasn't just Joseph that was profited by him being sold into slavery. It was his family. It was the children that came after them and uh, everyone who, who would come from them. So we've got millions of people who are benefited by that. So, okay, let's, let's wrap this up. Um, uh, Matthew 26, I'll just go through these real quick. Because I don't want to end halfway through a slide. I, I'm never going to remember what we were talking about. And Matthew 26. Starting in verse, actually 25, and then we'll just kind of backtrack and then go forward a little bit. So, um, And Judas, who was betraying him, in the process of betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. <laughs> While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And I think it's kind of important the way that Matthew doesn't, Adam, that Judas, where when Judas left in, in that bit. Because he kind of wants to show that, yes, Jesus broke his body even for Judas. Unfortunately, Judas wasn't paying attention to that part, and he went out and hanged himself instead. So, okay, um, when somebody betrays you, guess what? As hard as it is, guys, it's not the end. It's not the end. Jesus still had other things he was going to do, even Jesus was, and Judas was in the process of betraying him. Jesus still had things to do. It is not the end. Um, it's, it hurts, but it, it is not the end. Uh, 26, 22. Some people say, can you minister to people with a hurt heart? And the answer is yes and no. Here's the thing. If you wait until you're no longer hurt about anything, you will never minister to anybody. But here's also another thing. If you don't deal with the hurt that you've got, you won't be able to really minister to people. So it's kind of a yes and a no. Moral of the story being is, Yes, you should be healing, but yes, you should be reaching out to others. It's a complicated thing, but as you seek God, he'll guide you in the process. Matthew 26, 22, uh, being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, surely not I. Surely not I. I just imagine, you know, when you, find, when you ask your kids, who did this? And they all do this. Not me. It was Teresa, Daddy. Like, this actually literally just happened yesterday. Mike and Teresa are both supposed to be taking a nap. And I hear, I hear a bunch of noise coming from there. So I go and I look. And obviously Teresa's talking. She's in her room talking, obviously. And as soon as she sees me, she stops. And then I turn to Mike and he says, It was her. I heard <laughs> his voice. That little, that little conniver. And I said, you know what? I wasn't going to give you a spin. But you don't blame it on somebody else when you were to blame, too. I remember a certain story in the Garden of Eden, you know, where Adam was like, no, it was her. And Eve's like, no, it was him. And, you know, going down the process. I remember that story. Anyways, so uh, then 35 through 36, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing, too. Everybody's saying, I'm not going to deny you. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He knew that Peter was wrong. He knew that all of his disciples were wrong. He knew that Judas was in the process of betraying him. And still, what does he do? He goes out and gets focused on what, what his mission is. And this applies for getting refocused, too. Maybe you were focused once upon a time. You need to get refocused. Uh, then in verse 38 through 39, Then he said to, the, said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went with... Uh, went, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So obviously, whenever you face a betrayal, prayer should be the first place you go to. Well, what, say that again? Whenever you face a betrayal, prayer should be the first place you go to. You should pray in preparation for a problem. You should pray in the middle of a problem. And you should pray when you're getting out of a problem. You pray all the time. That sounds like a good idea. I do. Yeah. And remember, in all these things, the idea of eternity. You know, remember that life is short. And, uh, you know, remember that when you've been betrayed and you feel so hurt and everything. Just remember. Eternity is a lot longer than what we got going on here. Sorry. And then the last thing I want to look at in this part, which, once again, Jesus is just the master here, guys. And Jesus said to him, friend, 
do what you have come for. Uh, Judas comes up and, and sees him there. Then they came uh, and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. I believe it's the Gospel of Mark that tells us there's Peter. Uh, then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword will, will perish by the, by the sword. So with that being said, the last thing that we're going to talk about, the last little point, and we're, we're going to close with this, do not seek revenge when you're betrayed. Don't post on Facebook about it. Don't ever post on Facebook about it. In fact, just stay off Facebook, and then I'll fix the problem. Because then you can't see anything else to make you more mad. That sounds like a good idea, right? Don't go and badmouth them to people in the community. If they badmouth you to people in the community, let it go. Let it go. Um, I was actually going to actually had a, had a quote here from Spl Master Splinter from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I said, "No, I'm not going to quote Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles." <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, keep, just keep those things in mind, and, uh, and and remember that people will betray you. But you can't let somebody else's actions change your heart and your actions. Rather, use the betrayal as an opportunity to dig into your heart and see where your heart is wrong. Now, I know what we like to do. We like to say, but they're the ones who wronged us. Yes, but we can all grow. So ask yourself in the middle of your betrayal, in the middle, middle of your disappointment, how can I act more like Jesus would have acted in this situation? And that changes the outlook, because now I'm no, no longer focused on the wrong they did. Now I'm focused on comparing myself to Christ. And that puts us in a whole different ballgame. Yeah, remember that was real popular in the 90s? <laughs> <laughs>